Veteran judge Bernard Mahabo Nguepe has just launched his debut book, Rich Pickings, Out of the Past. In it, he makes a series of frank and sobering observations about South Africa's past and present, with lessons on subjects ranging from GBV to family values and the transformation of the judiciary. Justice Nguepe boasts a stellar record for his contributions to and participation in the country's legal profession, acting as a pioneer and trailblazer for other black professionals. I joined him at his home to chat about his latest venture and his counsel for the country during politically and socially turbulent times. Judge Nguepe, thank you for having me at your house and thank you for a lovely pot of tea. You are, you are welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> what a wonderful excuse. This is the occasion of you having written a book to be able to spend time together uh, reflecting not only on what you've written, but also the state we're in in South Africa today. So I'm really excited for the conversation. And I guess I want to start off with this, um, this kind of humility that we see you express throughout your book. You didn't want this to be an autobiography. You didn't want a book to be written about yourself. Why were you so specific that this had to be about something bigger than yourself? Uh, I, was, I was specific because, uh, firstly, uh, I didn't think that uh, writing about myself uh, would have been a tremendous thing. What is so important about me as an individual? I know uh, some people urged me time and again to write uh, a biography of myself, but no, I didn't think that I would go that way. I'm not Mandela, what's, what's there to read about me? But the point is, um, the, the book goes beyond myself. And as I say in the book itself, I don't own history. And I don't, I have no monopoly on wisdom. So what I do in the book then is to go beyond myself. And I look at events that are uh, above me, below me, around me, and indeed events that even were experienced by different people. And I theme them out and I say, well, what's there to learn from all these events? That ethos of doing for yourself, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps was very strongly instilled in you as a young boy. Absolutely, yes. And uh, I, 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 I challenge young people of today and I, I, I end up that part of the book by saying good things don't come by themselves. You've got to work hard for them. But then I, I say that um, um, during those days, as you correctly say, uh, no family would be allowed to go to sleep without food if their neighbor said something. And people talk now lately of, about Ubuntu as if it's a new thing, as if, as if it's a fashionable thing. It may be fashionable to talk about it, but these things happened in the past. We lost them. They are no longer there. And uh, these were the things that held communities together. These were the things that um, ensure that as society we manage to go on, we look after ourselves. The strange thing, na nature is a very interesting thing. It has provided each one of us, in fact every species, with certain instincts which from time to time have to, have to kick in action in order to ensure that not only do we, su do, do we survive, but we perpetuate ourselves as, 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 as the human race. And these things are like looking after your, your child, then you look after the child, the children in the community and the like. And uh, I just think that we have lost some of them. Uh, well, as you know, that is the, the gist of the book. Let's go back in history. Let's go and dig in history. You don't even have to dig deep into history to find all these hidden values and lessons that m make sure that we, we lead as a people, and even as peoples, we lead a better life and make the world a better place, let alone making South, Africa, making South Africa a better place. The one thing that stands out as well is this lack of romance about growing up poor. And the sentence for me really stood out, um, where you say that poverty should never be embraced. There is no virtue in doing so. Poverty dehumanizes a person. Um, and, you know, embedded in that, in these experiences with your grandmother, uh, Mahabo, who was uh, visually impaired, who had a visual impairment, um, and the lessons she taught you about being stoic and resilient, even in a context of not having very much. This w was something quite powerful. And how does it resonate for us in South Africa today, where even though we have managed to 
throw off the yoke of apartheid, poverty is still very much an uncomfortable bedfellow of ours. And yet, it could have been, if not totally avoided, drastically reduced. You know why? Because, and this is also with reference to the gulf between the rich and the poor in this country. People say that we have got the widest gulf in, 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 in the world. Um, and yet, this country is not poor. If this country was poor, if this country did not have resources, we would not have been having millionaires and billionaires in this country. You don't have, you don't cultivate billionaires and millionaires in a country which is poor. This is a rich country with resources. And the important thing is how to exploit those resources, we, to harness our own energies and bring them together to make sure that we use and employ those resources in the way that will benefit all of us. But it is again about making sure that we work hard together honestly. And we have missed so many chances. I may have to come back to that again because those are very strong issues that I've, I feel about in the book. Is that the reason why you put it as such a strong tenet of your book in the beginning? This focus on family, this focus on hard work, this focus on despite the environment, we have the power to create the life of our own dreams, even in a, con in a context of oppression. It's not the professor of law that taught me for the first time how to treat a woman. It's not the professor of law who for the first time taught me about to respect somebody's property. It's not the professor of law that for the first time taught me to respect my neighbor's privacy by not making too much noise, by not making, uh, playing my radio too much. It is my grandmother who could never read or write. It was my mother who was semi-literate. Now all those things, those things are taught in us by the family. But you know where we lose the point. We lose the point when we grow up. And we begin to think that my behavior should only be re regulated by hat law. My behavior should only be regulated by Mr. Kale, the Minister of Police. I can do anything as long as he doesn't break the law. It's fine. That's wrong. We disregard very important rules which regulate our conduct, including uh, religious rules. You know, as you're talking, I'm, I'm remembering something you wrote in the beginning as well about corporal punishment. When I read it, I kind of sat up in my chair a little bit. I thought, is Judge a proponent of corporal punishment? But you framed it in an interesting way. Share it with our viewers. I have a problem. When some people begin to suggest that um, uh, uh, corporal punishment, if administered, would necessarily result in children being violent. I, I just posed a question. I said, well, I recall I was subjected to corporal punishment at the school, but I don't remember turning out to be a violent person. I remember my friends and colleagues at primary school being subjected to corporal punishment, but I don't recall they became so violent as to assault their teachers. I don't recall that they became so violent as a result of that. But let me make the point. I wasn't saying that <laughs> I was not advocating for corporal punishment. I was just saying, pointing out the difficulty that you are confronted with. Let me contextualize that point properly, which you have raised, before people misunderstand it. <laughs> this is the point. How do we manage to reach a point today where teachers, uh, where children assault teachers? How do we reach the point where children today time and again, step each other to death at school. We didn't have that point. Where did we, re how did we manage to read that point? We managed to read that point because we failed to learn certain lessons. And that was the point that I, that I was making. When you were needing a place to become a candidate's attorney, one of your professors reached out um, to an Afrikaans law firm who actually opened the door for you. Obviously, you, you had struggled to try and get a place. I mean, it was difficult for black candidate attorneys at that time to get a place to, to practice the law, in a sense. Um, share with us this different framing you're encouraging us to have about the role that white people, particularly white Afrikaners, played um, in in creating positive opportunities, particularly when it came to your career advancement? 
You know, there are certain perceptions in this country which needs to be dispelled. And one of them was an assumption that um, uh, only white people, people of a certain language, played a role uh, during the struggle. It is not so. There are many African-speaking people who would sacrifice their futures, their careers, in their fight against apartheid. Do I have to mention people like Bram Fisher? Is there anyone who doesn't know about them? Do I have to mention Bears Nodi? There are so many of them uh, who contributed towards the struggle. And, 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 and I mentioned that particular professor to demonstrate that particular point that um, the way white African-speaking African people who contributed a great deal uh, during the struggle and in many ways in, in many ways and uh, yeah and in your personal life specifically yes. um, there was a, a huge impact in opening the way for you uh, breaking as you as you comment in the book a 300 year tradition of keeping black people out of the legal profession um, you in this law firm the very first black candidate's attorney and even when there was a blatant blatant attempt at racism within that organization the partners in the firm acted the partner in the firm acted and we are talking a situation where I, where when I was about to be taken and into that firm I was going to be the first professional person a black person ever to be taken into that firm and, uh, and uh, the senior partner called the staff of about 30, 40 people to say, hey, on people, we are going to have the first black professional person to come and join us in this firm and they told everybody to cooperate. But uh, soon thereafter, it reached him that one of the typists said that uh, she was going to, once that black, black person comes into the firm, she was going to bring her own cup of tea because she dreaded the possibility of one time just happening to use a cup that I would have used. And uh, when it reached that, that particular partner, he called the staff, related the incident, and turned to the person concerned and said, you are fired. There was some determination to some extent on the part of some people to put things right. Where does that moment sit in South Africa today where, you know, there is still a struggle around the transformation of the judiciary and the role that a lot more female legal professionals can play within the law profession? Um, we have not yet reached the point that we reached. There has been some transformation of the judiciary of the judiciary to an extent and you'll recall that uh, when I was appointed judge president I was the only black judge in Pretoria and maybe one or two in Johannesburg and my objective was oh I'm going to be the judge president one of my my main objective is to try and transform the judiciary which I thought I did but that's a discussion for another day I made some contribution but there is still some difficulty about that we haven't reached that point and there were some challenges, um, and uh, given the centrality uh, of the judiciary, the central role that the, ju the judiciary was going to play in this country, there were tremendous problems about that. And uh, you'll read in the book that when I was interviewed, I was vehemently opposed. The number of people who did not want me at that time to be, to be uh, to be appointed judge president. And, uh, and one of the people interviewed me and said, you must wait. Uh, it's not your time, you must wait. Why can't you wait? I said, no, I can't wait. And he became so agitated that he, he said to me, why can't you wait? And that's when I responded, I said, sir, I can't wait anymore. I've waited for 300 years to be appointed judge president. I've waited long enough. And that created some bit of an awkward moment during the interview, but maybe that's the kind of language that sometimes we need to speak. And I, I want, I want the, the other point I want to make out of that kind of scenario is that, please, all of us, those of you who are going to contest for strategic positions in this country, please be prepared to find that there's going to be huge contestation against you. Please be prepared that there may well be blood on the, on the floor. But don't be deterred. Don't be put back because you need to know why you want to aspire for that particular position. Uh, you know, because 
this was a theme. I mean, you know, if I think back also to the day that you became an admitted attorney, it was a tumultuous day in South Africa. It was June 16th. The Soweto riots had just erupted. The country was burning. Um, you had just taken your oath. You had gone on then to receive many rejection letters from law firms saying they couldn't hire a Bantu from the Transvaal. And that ambition in this context of a country that needed you, needed a black lawyer to defend the rights of a number of marginalized black people, um, you know, kind of morphs into the formation of the Black Lawyers Association. And this lobbying that you had to do is pioneering lobbying for law firms owned and run by black attorneys to be in the city centers where it could be more easily accessible. There's, there's a running theme about the fact that the Black Lawyers Association still has a strong work that it needs to accomplish and progress that it needs to accomplish in South Africa. Well, for a body like that to continue existing, it only, it only tells you one thing, that there is still a need for that kind of thing to, for that kind of body to exist. You know, when a body or an association uh, no longer needs to exist. It will fizzle out. People will no longer go to the meetings. People will no longer be interested in it. But if that kind of body continues to exist, it means that the problems that it meant to address are still there. And is demonstration of the fact that we have not yet reached to where we want to be. I think maybe let's move then. And, and this was also interesting to me. I didn't know that you were also at one point a bottle store owner. <laughs> That was a story that made me chuckle a little bit. I don't know if you want to comment just a little bit about that. You know, within sometimes there's no straight line in a career. It's going to take some detours and you, you know, you make some choices and decisions uh, that people in hindsight might say, what? You see, I was, I was trying to demonstrate a particular point. And, and uh, I said the whole purpose of own, owning a bottle store at the time, it was an attempt to try and prepare myself to venture into the unknown. And the, the theme there is the issue of preparation. How and planning. When is planning for the future, for the unknown, enough? Is it ever enough? And I say sometimes we, 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 we fail ourselves. We indulge in over planning so much that in fact we end up uh, making it too difficult for ourselves to venture into the unknown. And yet it is important that sometimes we must try and move out of the comfortable zones and go into the unknown. The issue is how do you plan? But let us, don't over plan for something. I think I over planned <laughs> <laughs> when I tried to move from yeah. being attorney to being an advocate. And, and you, you, managed to do it, you managed to do it successfully. Judge, there are so many other, you know, delicious moments of reflection in your book as you look at society, as you look at the progression of the, the, the law profession itself, some of the experiences that you had. And I suppose, you know, in closing, I really want to reflect on um, where we are in South Africa today. One of the things you were really keen that we discussed in this interview was on this can-do attitude that we need to have as a country with the things that we have at our disposal and within our control to create the country of our dreams. And you make a comparison between how the Afrikaners were able to do it and, and where we sit now in democracy. Well, actually, that brings us to the main purpose of the book as to why I wrote the book. Uh, is because we fail to learn, for example, from the, say, from the Afrikaner people and, uh, and also from the people who were the champions of apartheid. And I'm not glorifying apartheid. I'm saying that let us sit back and let, let's look as, to, as to, to, let us look at their history. You know, after the Africana took over the run of this country, let me just say from 1948, after the National Party came to power, they, they went into massive projects such as inter, industrialization of the country. They started building things uh, such as ESCOM and the like. They had people like for example, D Dr. Van Bale, very Dr. Fa Van der Bale. Very people know that the town of Van, Van der Bale Park is actually named after one of the greatest African industrialists, Dr. Van der Bale. They drove institutions and built institutions such as such as ESCOM. We speak as how do you write ESCOM with a K? You know where that K K from? You don't write ESCOM with a C. You write ESCOM with a K. It comes it comes from an African word, Komisi. 
something like the city committee. Same thing applies to telecom. You write telecom with a K, they show the dominance of Africans in those institutions. And they build them to provide work for their people and so forth and so on. What did we do after we came to power? Let me talk about this thing of apartheid. They showed commitment. However ill-advised the policy was, but the people who, were, who told themselves that they were going to implement apartheid, they did so with commitment. They were able to oppress millions and millions of black people. Why? Because they were committed to what they were doing. Now, if people who were implementing an evil system that was declared by the United Nations to be crime against humanity, if they could implement it with so much commitment and determination, why can't we, being the people who are charged with the duty to implement a dispensation which is acclaimed by the rest of the world as the best, why can't we double that commitment and make that plausible political dispensation even a better success than, than, a, than apartheid which in the end failed? Why, why can't we do that? What's you know, standing in our way? This is what is standing in our way. You know, I, I, I read some, not so, not so long ago I read about, I think it's Afri Forum, which they are saying that they are going to build uh, tertiary institutions in which uh, ex institutions of excellence and thank God they said they are not going to discriminate against anybody but they said they were going to build those institutions um, even as they are uh, the Afri Forum or we ever are thinking of building those institutions of excellent excellent learning we are busy burning schools in Vuwani because we didn't want to simply because we didn't want to fall in, under a particular municipality. We banned some 20-something schools in Vuwani. In Vuwani. Even as this Afri Forum is busy building schools, we stopped children from going to school because the, the government didn't tar the road that goes through the village. We prevent children from going to school to such an extent that the government has to come and take the children out of the village and put them in a camp so that they can prepare for their examinations taking the children, rescuing, as it were, the children from their own parents so that they could go and learn. Because their parent, own parents are preventing them to go to school because, because uh, the government doesn't build a tar route for them. That is the problem. And that's not the end of the matter. When I was appointed a judge, I had a huge library because I had practiced for many years as an attorney and as an advocate until I was senior counsel. I took a substantial portion of my library and donated it to one of the black universities, only to read in the newspapers two years down the line that students at that particular university set the university alight, the library alight. How do you think I felt? I felt bad about it. But that's, those are the things that we shouldn't be doing. Not only that, uh, Iman, not so long ago we were reading about students who were setting alight university infrastructure. Those are the things that we shouldn't do. Those are the things we should refrain from doing. And we just don't learn. And until we learn properly, from the history of others, we will, never we will never succeed. I was telling somebody the other day that we failed to learn from the apartheid regime. We even failed to learn how to steal properly, if there's such a thing. During their time, there was corruption. When they built the N1, the N2, there was corruption. They stole the money, but the roads were built. But today, the money is not there and the road is not there. And I can validate that point with reference. In the Eastern Cape right now, there is what is supposed to be a stadium. But it's not really a stadium. The money is gone and what's standing there is not a stadium. Here in Pretoria, in the capital city, two weeks ago, a month or so, there was a debate about uh, the HM Picture Stadium. The money is gone. The stadium, stadium is not suitable for you. What's going to save us? Let us go back and risk, recover those values which are taught to us by our parents. Let us learn to know that human behavior is not only there to be controlled by cold law, by, by Mr. Kerle. 
Human behavior is controlled by certain values which must inculcate in our people and uh, even rules of religion, they play a role in, 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 in structuring a proper society. But above all, above all, we must learn to show the commitment which other nations, other people, even under apartheid, showed in trying to build their countries. That is the kind of commitment that we need. We must go there. Judge Ngwepe, uh, we have had real tea and we've had figurative tea. Thank you so much um, for our, your conversation with us today. We wish you well with your book. Um, and of course, Rich Pickings Out of a Life is available uh, almost immediately from all reputable booksellers. And we look forward to having another conversation with you.